Thank you, Doug. Well, I'll tell you what. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I have uh, been asked before, what is the uh, most, uh, oh, I don't know what you'd want to call it, well-received message you've ever done? Uh, people initially think, well, sheep, Art of Intimacy, Song of Solomon, chapter 4. It's really not true. I, I did a, a message years ago at Denton Bible Church, and um, I had uh, calls from all over the country from ladies that got a hold of it. And they said, could you send us um, 10 of these? Could they they uh, wrote James Dobson on Focus on the Family and said, you must play this, you must put this on. And yet, it's from a text. Uh, I had women tell me that this was the most um, glorified or glorifying and honoring to women text they had ever seen. And yet it's set in the context of what often is looked at as absolutely scandalous um, by certain women. And so uh, rather than just um, give you a, an overview of it, I'm just going to start teaching into it. And I think you'll see by the time we expound on it uh, what this text has to say about a particular aspect of womanhood. And we're going to have some things to say about fellows tonight also. 1 Timothy 2, in verse, in verse 9, really, this should probably begin verse 2. That chapter 2, verse 1 through uh, 8, probably should end chapter 1. I wasn't around when they broke this thing into chapters. Nobody asked me, but... Uh, <laughs> Really, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 8, is talking about how the believer relates to Caesar, that he prays for him, models for the world, um, that he is, doesn't isolate himself, but he's among them, um, because this is God loves them and Christ gave his life for them. And so that text really ends chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, that is the chief purpose of the church. In, in verse 9 of chapter 2, really that should begin chapter 2 because you're going to begin looking now at the leadership of the church. Because I don't care if you have a great philosophy of ministry there in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, you have to have great leaders. Now in that well-known text in chapter 3, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, to good work he desires to do. But what is the purpose of a woman? Before Paul says, if any man aspires, he's going to tell you exactly uh, where a woman stands in the body of Christ and in the creative design and the dictate of God. And so in verse 9, he says, I want women to cosmeo. We get our word cosmetic. They are to be pretty. They are to adorn themselves, but they're not to work so much on the husk, on the hull, on the shell. They're to put on what First Peter calls that which is precious in the sight of God. And it's the Greek word, ladies, in First Peter 3, expensive. What kind of cosmetic? The word cosmos or cosmeo means ordered. And a pretty woman is a woman that, that in a sense, uh, fixes herself in an ordered way. And he says, I want women to order themselves or adorn themselves with proper clothing. And he mentions modestly and discreetly. Incidentally, that word uh, modest is the Greek word shamefacedness. And it means that a woman should have the character to be able to blush before she leaves the room when she looks at herself. Modestly and discreetly, not with, and he looks at external things, and the idea is not that a woman should not braid her hair or wear gold or pearls or costly garments, but that she should not have all of her beauty on those things. There is no admonition in Scripture to be ugly for Jesus. All right? You should be as pretty as you can be. But it's talking about that you don't put all of your attention on the external. But in verse 10, this is the First Peter 3, that which is expensive in the sight of God. It's impressive to God. Paul says, rather by means of good works, as befits women making a claim to godliness. There is nothing more lovely in a woman than her soul. 
what Peter called the precious or the, the expensive quality of a gentle and quiet spirit that is expensive in the eyes of God, a woman's heart. And in verse 11, he talks about a woman within the context of the church. Let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. He's talking here about the, within the body of Christ, those positions that will be outlined in chapter 3, 4, and 5, that of pastor and elder and deacon, those that handle the word in an official sense in the church, but to remain quiet. Now, why is it that a woman is not to have a position of a pastor or of a elder or of deacon, or things like that? And incidentally, there is some controversy over this in the church, and to be perfectly honest, and you can just put an asterisk by this, this is my personal opinion, uh, the controversy will not come from the Bible. Now, the Bible is very clear. The controversy will come from the teaching of the Bible as opposes the consensus of man. And it's much like the controversy over creation evolution. There is no controversy within the Bible over creation evolution. Uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, homosexuality among the professing Christian, there is no controversy in the Bible over the issue of homosexuality. And there is no real controversy over the issue of a woman in a position of leadership, not within the confines of inerrancy. It's only a controversy if you break the confines of the assumption of the inerrancy of the Word of God. And so it is very clear right here. Now, why is it that a woman does not teach or exercise authority? Well, it's not because a woman is not as smart as a man, because most of the times they are smarter. Um, I'm here to tell you. It's not because they are uh, less gifted, because the fact is they're extremely gifted. As a matter of fact, they're extremely sensitive to things that are out there. It has nothing to do, in verse 13 and 14, with a woman's talents. That verse 13 begins with the word for, which means Paul is about to explain to you why it is that a woman doesn't take an official position over a man. Verse 13, because it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. In other words, it is the order of creation. God did not make Adam and Eve at the same time out of the dirt, the dust. He made Adam. And to Adam, he gave the dictates of the creation. And then he made from Adam's side to teach him about his love for this woman, his intimacy of this woman. The Talmud, or one of the Jewish writings, I believe, it says that God did not make a woman from his feet to be beneath him or his head to be over him, but from his side to be under his wing, to be close to him. And he brings this woman to the man. And God does not give the dictates of the creation to the woman. The man gave it to the woman. And there was no command in Genesis 1 and 2 for the woman to be submissive. It was assumed because of the order of creation. That Adam would have said, Eve, do you love me? And she would have said, who else? Uh, or, um, <laughs> yes, I love you. More than any man alive, I love you. <laughs> you are the handsome, most intelligent woman of the universe, as a matter of fact. And so, God made uh, an order of the creation. And so there was no command of submission, because there was no sense of rebellion, and there was an understanding because of the order of the creation. Um, incidentally, it states in 1 Corinthians 11, this is an interesting verse, Paul says that man was created as the image and glory of God, talking of the male, and woman of the glory of man. There is a sense in which the image of God is more extensive in a male than a female. Now, before you throw a pew at me, let me tell you what that means. Incidentally, I don't believe any of this. I'm just parroting Doug Hudson on a lot of it. Just kidding. Uh, Paul said that man is in the image and glory of God, woman in the glory of man. Uh, the image of God is more extensive in man in a sense in that God is depicted in the Bible as in maleness. And man as his glory was that which 
like a king has a crown to show his majesty, the male carried out the leadership of the home. That he was, in a sense, he was the one that was in authority. And so in that sense, the maleness of God showed itself in the creation of a male, of a man. That's why God is pictured in the Bible as the king of the universe. He is the Christ, is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that there is a maleness to God. Uh, the woman was the glory of man in the same way as a king would show his majesty through a crown, that that woman was the majesty of a man. She received all of his affection and all of his glory because of her beauty and her preciousness to him. But even though male and female created he them in the image of God, there is a sense in which man is even more extensive because he is, by the order of creation, by his very nature, he is given to be the ruler. Um, C.S. Lewis was once asked during the Anglican controversy as to whether women should be pastors. And he said, no. And he didn't give an answer simply on scriptural ground. He felt men should be the pastors. It was in the uniqueness of C.S. Lewis from a philosophic idea. He said, it's not because a woman is not any more intelligent, because they are, and it's not because they're any less creative or sensitive or this or this or this or this. He said, it is because a woman in a position of authority over a man in the church would misrepresent the person of God. He said, God, much as we chagrin and chafe under it sometimes, is represented in maleness. He is represented as king in that sense. Um, give you a little insight to something here. It is interesting whenever you saw sin in the Garden of Eden, that you saw the man, the male, lose that aspect of the image of God. He became a wimp in the garden. God said, who Adam, did you eat of the tree? And instead of taking his position as leader and saying, yes, I did, kill me, save her, he said, moi, the woman. And I didn't ask for her. You gave her to me. She did it. And Eve burned up. Eve, as soon as you see sin, you see man step down. He loses in his sinfulness that which was the image of God. He is not the leader anymore. He stepped down, and the woman steps up. Did you eat of it? She said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. She said, I did it. You have a strong woman assuming the leadership and a weak man. And so, uh, that incidentally is one of the great um, problems within males of the species. That in our sinfulness, we not only are separated from him that is our life and being, but we wimp out. That men will not be men in their sinfulness. And women have to take the reins and to take over a lot of times. All right? So, if you feel dogged, fellas, be dogged, because you are. <laughs> So that is the order of the creation. It is the male, and then it is the female. And that's why with the nation of Israel, you have 12 tribes, and they are males. They are leaders. The priesthood is a male, Aaron through Levi. The deliverer is Moses. And yet, interestingly enough, Jacob had another child that was a daughter named Dinah. And if you put down the moral qualities of those brothers, you don't see any imperfections in Dinah, except that she went out one time and simply got raped, and that's not an imperfection. But you see in the other brothers minor problems like murder, um, lying, cheating, things like this, except for Joseph and Benjamin. And so Dinah was a marvelous lady, better than her brothers, but there was not a position bestowed upon her among the disciples. The disciples were males because there were no women. If you were at the cross when Jesus was dying, you saw women standing tough. You saw Peter and the guys um, heading south as fast as they could. And the women were saying, you know, kill me if you need be. So it's women that assume the leadership. But nevertheless, it was the male that God put in the position as the apostle, as Timothy, as Titus, and all of these. 
And so the reason that a woman, that a man, is given the position of leadership is not because of his talent. It is because of the sovereign order of God within the creation. And the woman is called, uh, at least within a home, how about an unmarried woman? That's another sermon for another day. Within a home, she is the glory of the man. And he dies for her. He glories in her. He babies her. He, he exalts her. He boasts in her like when you want to see the majesty of England, you look at the, at the crown jewels. That's the majesty of a nation. And that's why the greatest compliment you ever give men is to ask why such a glorious woman would have married an idiot <laughs> like him. And men will all throw their chest out and say, yes, I am an idiot. <laughs> and yes, she is glorious because that is their crown, is that woman. So why is it that men lead? It is not, guys, because we are any more this or that. It's because God simply made a decision and within the very nature of God, who is maleness, he made male and female. And so it was thrust upon us. And there is another reason in verse 14. And he gets repetitive. It was not Adam who was deceived. The woman being quite deceived, and the rest of that verse 14 is in the imperfect in Greek. It means that it's an action that is not completed. A perfect action is perfected, it's finished. It doesn't say that the woman being quite deceived um, sinned. That would be a perfect verb. It says the woman being quite deceived became and still is a transgressor. She fell in her very nature. Now, what's Paul talking about? Is there something in where he's talking about in Genesis chapter 3 where the woman upon her sin was constitutionally changed to become a rebel? Yes, there is. Keep your finger here and let's start a riot. <laughs> Go over. We haven't had a good riot here in Wait. Go over to Genesis chapter 3 and let's look at the text that Paul is looking at. No problem. Now again, I'm not teaching this evening on uh, creation or maleness or femaleness. This is merely the um, path to take us to the major verse I'm going to show you. The woman, being quite deceived, became and still is a sinner. Upon the curse of God, upon the first family, and upon the serpent, and upon the creation, and then the animals, and then everything else, in verse 16, to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Every time a woman has a child, there is a reminder that she has something that is born for death. She has something that is fundamentally flawed. She has something that is conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity. Now the reason you don't understand that is because you're single. Someday you will have one of these individuals and uh, they would come out of the room smoking a cigar and cursing you <laughs> because they do not like rules, they don't like authority even more than, than they are when they get a little bit older. And so you have pain in childbirth while the husband is sitting there going, push, dear, push. Oh. Yes. I've heard that when a woman goes through labor, they should take every man and hang him by his ears at 90-second intervals to make him identify with that woman. I think it's true. Verse 16. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Your desire shall be for your husband. That's a strong Hebrew word, and it means to dominate something and consume it. There are only two other occasions that Hebrew word occurs in the entire Bible. One is in the book of Song of Solomon. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. My desire is for him. Amen. And it means a passion. She longs to, in a sense, to devour him. She longs for him. Now, is that what it means? That a woman is part of a curse? 
has an inordinate sexual passion for her husband. You've heard me say that if that is true, might God smite my wife often with that curse. I don't think that's what it means. And it, and it wouldn't make sense. Your desire, your sexual passion shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. No, it, it doesn't fit grammatically. The other time the word is used is right next door in Genesis 4. And it's in the identical same Hebrew structure. In verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Now watch the construction. Its desire is for you, but you must rule it or master it. 316b, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule you. In 4.6, desire has the idea of sin taking control, consuming something. And that matches up in Genesis 3.16. Part of being a fallen man is that you and your sin don't like parents, you don't like bosses, you don't like governments, and usually we don't like God telling us what to do. In our sinful states, we are rebels. Now, a woman has another area of authority as a sinner that she doesn't like, and that's her husband. Your desire shall be for your husband. Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, meaning to dominate you. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Prior to the fall, there was no edict of submission because of the nature of Adam and Eve, unfallen, and the order of creation. After the fall, here is your first order to the woman. The husband is now by dictate, not by the order of creation simply, but by a divine command. He is in charge. Why? Because the woman feels something she never felt as a sinner. Her desire is to dominate her husband. I asked my wife once, I said, sweetheart, does this text mean what it would appear? That you have in your fallen condition, as I, a hatred of authority, and you don't like my authority. And that you, as a sinner, naturally feel like rebelling unless the word of God subdues you. And my darling said to me, why do you think I am told three times in the New Testament to submit to you? She said, it's because I'm a sinner. And no, I don't like being under your authority. <laughs> Crushed me. But she was being honest. And there are lots of times my wife has to, to apologize to me. She'll be disrespectful to me. Um, and she admits that she's a sinner. The same as I don't like authority over me unless I'm subdued by the word of God. So part of the fall is that the woman became a transgressor and God issued an edict. He shall rule. So let's go back here to 1 Timothy. And now we see the Pauline understanding of the text. Why is it that a woman doesn't have an official position over a man? Because in verse 13, it is contrary to the order and the, and the purpose of creation. And in verse 14, it is contrary to the dictate of creation. The mandate of God. The woman became a transgressor, and it is tacitly here, and he shall rule over you. Question. A woman is not to teach men. So, what is her purpose? If man can have the glorious purpose of being a spiritual leader in the church of God, and if woman does not have it, so what is woman's salvation in the sense of significance? Verse 15. But, meaning in contrast, Woman shall be, and it's the word saved, sotir. And the word sotir in the New Testament can mean 
according to the context, saved from whatever the context speaks of. We are not speaking here of salvation. The context has nothing on salvation. I once heard this genius once proclaim that you could not be in heaven as a woman unless you had children. Uh, to wit, there are a lot of great, glorious women in the Bible. Someone needed to instruct them that were widowed or uh, that were uh, barren women. And Paul instructs you: if you can be a woman that can stay single for complete service to God, do so. First Corinthians seven. And so, that's not that. No, the sotir, the salvation, is talking about the woman's nobility of purpose. If she is not to be a leader in the church then what is her salvation in the sense of her purpose? Verse 15, women shall be saved, meaning in their purpose, through childbearing. If they, now that they is a pronoun that most refers probably to the nearest noun, the children. It's being a certain kind of mother. If they, possibly the mother and the child, because having a kid doesn't make you noble. It's a certain kind of kid from a certain kind of mother. If the children continue in faith, you bring them to the knowledge of Christ. Love, you teach them to be as loving and as noble as you are. Sanctity, you teach them to be moral and godly and pure. And sobriety or self-control you teach them to be women that are submitted to the glory of God and to his word. What is Paul saying? He's saying a statement that is so incredible in our day. He's saying that the most noble purpose of a woman is not to teach men. It is to raise them. He's talking about the glories of motherhood. Uh, I don't think that there is any one position in our country and in our world that has taken more of a hit than motherhood. It will not take it from the Bible, but it will take it from our culture. And I think a lot of it's because we have, in American society, taken the idea of the career and we have made it the summa bonum of all existence, not just women. But men have done this. Men have sold a bill of goods to a culture and a lot of times to the, the female populace that the most glorious thing about being a man is that you can have this idea of a career. A career is an all right deal. But nonetheless, the idea of a career is not a big biblical enterprise. For a man to forsake a wife and a child and a home for a career. Some of you came from homes where your father made a deity of his career. And you came away bitter against him, bitter against the home, bitter against everything. You didn't see it as noble. You saw it as, um, as a man um, defaulting on his responsibilities. Many of you saw mothers that, whose hearts were broken by covetous fathers that exalted a career and they were absent. And you didn't see that as the summa bonum. You didn't see it as a great and glorious thing that your father had his master and his doctorate and spent 16 hours a day at work and left your mother at home. You ended up bitter at him. And so the idea of nobility in a career is not biblical. And we have sold this, I think, to the female community. Anytime a man has a job, separate him from his love of God, his devotion to the gospel, and especially to his home. That is a self-centered, godless, and foolish male. There is nothing more glorious in your crown than your wife and your children. Now, men do not, the world do not applaud men that forsake their homes. But we've, I think women, bless their hearts, have embraced this. And somehow motherhood, I heard one feminist say that the home has, is a concentration camp that enslaves the woman. This was the same woman that said we women have finally become the men that we always wanted to marry. Great statement. And somehow motherhood is looked at kind of like Edith Bunker. 
that it's something that the ignorant and the untalented do because they can't do anything else. Somehow you ask a woman, what is her, what do you do for a living? She says, I'm a homemaker. Incidentally, you know what the New Testament calls a homemaker? It's the word oiko despotes. House oiko despot. The, the lord of the manor. That she's the one that manages that home and goes after it in the zeal of the woman of Proverbs 31 and makes her home um, a, a glorious thing. Uh, does it, can a woman have a career? Well, in Proverbs 31, there's a woman, the woman has about three jobs that she does. Does the Bible teach that a woman can have a career? It's silent on it. What it does teach is that a woman, a married woman, is to be a glorious mother. And that is her significance and her salvation in the sense of significance. It's her greatness for God in that home. Can a man have a career? Sure, but the Bible never says that's going to be your significance. Your salvation as a man of significance is in your service for God, where he tells you, and that is the home and in the church. No, the Bible exalts womanhood. I am told that the man who said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, was Napoleon Bonaparte. There was a Spanish proverb that an ounce of mother is worth a ton of priest. There's an old proverb that the way that a child first pronounces God is mother. No, the Bible exalts motherhood. People ask me at times, what does your wife do? And I say that she creates and she shapes eternal humanity in the image of Jesus Christ. What does yours do? <laughs> If my wife wants to go and be a whatever, I'll back her, I'll send her and help her be it. But her nobility is that my wife took our two boys at the age of four and brought them to faith. And she taught our sons how to love. And she taught them purity. And she taught them self-control. Now that's the greatness of a woman. So if she has a career, she does what? We, we complicate this issue. If you want to do that and you've got a great ability, do it. But ladies, don't impute to a career or a job what the Bible never does. Uh, if God so brings you in, uh, a husband and a, and a, what I'm trying to say, in a home, don't in any way buy into the lie of our day, whether a male or a female, that the home is a constricting thing that eats the life out of you. No, when you do it right, there is no greater joy than motherhood and being a father. And that day will come for a great, great many of you. Uh, don't buy into the, the lie that we're supposed to get married, spend 14 years waiting, then have a kid, and so that kid won't suck all the joy and the marrow out of our life. Have 12 children. <laughs> Have a whole tribe. And commit yourself to faith, love, sanctity, and sobriety. And I'll assure you, I don't care what your job is, when you die, I doubt there will be great amounts of people circling your coffin weeping because of your absence, but I'll assure you, to a great mother and a great father, uh, they will weep indeed. Women shall be saved through childbearing. The Apostle Paul and thus the Word of God and its inspiration exalts motherhood in all of its glory. Note these points. Faith. That means that when your child is born, that that woman takes that child and the first thing you want to say to that child, ladies, is that Jesus loves you. And you start reading to that little child, you guys and you ladies, you read to that child before that child knows words. You read to them out of those golden books. They should know every story in the Bible from the time that they're young. You fathers and mothers, when your child is put to bed at night, 
the greatest people in that child's life are the parent and God. Do you know what it does to a child's life to hear the two greatest people in his life talk to one another and this person tells this person how fantastic that that person is? And your child needs to hear you do that 365 days a year, that you pray with them and you exalt them in the eyes of God. And so that the most logical action of that child's life is that whoever Jehovah is and his son Jesus Christ, he made my father so wonderful and my mother so tender that whatever it is, I want to get on the inside track. Your child, by God's grace, should have no testimony. They shouldn't be able to remember debauchery. They should just get on the access road right there with you and just slide into salvation. Uh, led to Christ on the mother's knee. You bring your children to faith. Then you teach your child love. You, that child should grow up watching affection in your home. I taught in the Song of Solomon. I asked you all the question. I said, how many of you can imagine your parents making love? And I asked you to raise your hand. You remember that? And I heard all kind of sounds coming out of the audience. God help us. Uh, I can't imagine. You teach them love in your home. I got to tell you, in my home, my little boy one time, we were, uh, my wife and I have a custom that whenever I or one of us speaks harshly to the other one, we don't play. I have a rally like tennis and go back and forth. Whenever I talk harshly or disrespectful or something, my wife will say, was that harsh? <laughs> Man. I'm sorry. Was that this? Was were you rude right then? <laughs> Did you raise your voice? And uh, the same way, whenever she is um, disrespectful, or whenever she uh, can at times uh, desire me and take control, and I'll I'll not come back. I'll simply say, uh, "Were you harsh right then?" No. Okay. <laughs> I'll just go back and read my Bible some more. <laughs> But on one occasion, uh, Teresa was in the bathroom, and I was sitting on the bed on a Sunday morning, and she had a blow dryer going, and she was talking to me, and I was talking to her. And you know, when your wife's got a blow dryer, you got to yell so she can hear you, because she had one of them Black and Decker blow dryers. <laughs> All right. And she was, she was working at her, and I was working at her, at her you know. She's, I don't, I'm not sure why, but she's yelling back. I can hear her fine, you know, but she's yelling back at me. And John Clark, my little, he's my second one. He's about 17 now at the time. He's about four or five years old. And this little fella come running in his underwear. And he hit that door because he heard his father and mother yelling. And he'd never heard that phenomenon in his home. And he came running in. And he goes, fighting, fighting, fighting. And I said, no, we're not fighting. We're talking over the blue door. You teach your child love. You teach your child from the earliest age against racism. You teach them the glories of man. You teach them the glories of, of um, the young and the glories of the old. You teach them to stand up in the presence of the aged. You teach them to help the weak. You teach them it's more blessed to give than receive. From the time that they're little, you teach them how to love. You teach them purity. You teach them how to say no. You teach them that there are absolutes, that there, are, there is wrong in life, and that we do good because God is sovereign. You teach them self-control. Oh, listen, it'll be the most glorious life uh, to be a great, great mother. You know, I'm going to give you a couple of real quick kind of deals. Uh, I talked to you about getting into the idea that a career is summa bonum. Be great at your career, but don't impute to it what the Bible doesn't. If a career gets too much, it's covetousness, and that is called by the Bible idolatry because you have enthroned yourself to love with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Guy or girl, and it will never fulfill you because it's not infinite. 
Secondly, beware of your career. Now listen to me. If a woman has a job, that in itself is pro or con. No big deal. It's what you do with it. You be careful if you get married, and ladies, you have a job, to where that couple lives on both incomes and start spending both incomes. Because if that guy is making 47.5 and she starts out and she's making, let's call it 47.5, all of a sudden you've got, let's say, just say she's taking a job and she's making 30 and you're spending 70K. When the time comes to have a kid, you're going to have to make a choice about the exaltation of the home or whether to not to have this car but this one and not to live over here in this edition but over here in that edition. And quite often, the home loses because the couple paints themselves into a corner. And now they have built their lives upon a career. And a lot of times, the kid comes. And what do they do? The woman takes the kid and dishes it off to daycare. Why do you want, want a kid in daycare? Why did you have the kid anyway? You had the kid to complete the purpose of God in the kingdom of God and the dominion of good. And you can't stick, a, and this is no rap on daycare, they meet a need in our society. But the kid looks to mama and daddy. The woman in daycare has no maternal tie to that kid, and he's surrounded by about 12 other kids that are meaner than he is. And they're going to disciple that kid in how to fight. You had the kid to raise him, to rear him into the nobility of the glory of God. So beware of your career, of giving it what it doesn't demand and giving it a place that it doesn't have, and you forfeit now a kid for a dang Buick. And that's what it comes down to. I gave up my kid so we could have this car. I gave up my kid so that we could live here, not there. Beware of the subtlety of that. Thirdly, because that Buick will not put his arms around your neck. And that Buick will not name its grandkids after you. And that Buick will not praise you. The Buick won't cost you as much, ultimately. <laughs> Thirdly, guys, don't make your wife um, don't get her to the position of falling into this because you go to the store and you see these, a woman that dresses to the nines to go to her job and looks great and because she's in public she stays in shape and she's always working out looking good and here maybe you got a wife and maybe she can't get down as often to the gym and maybe she's got baby puke on her and maybe she had to get up at four to do this and to take care of that kid. And she doesn't look that good anymore. And what do you do? You say to her, why don't you lose some weight like her? Why don't you do this like her? That's the way guys get shot. You know that? <laughs> Listen, you put your arms around your wife, baby puke and all, smelling like diapers and all, and you glory in her and tell her how majestic that she is and how marvelous and how good she is. Because listen, you're the only strokes in our perverted society that that mother's going to get. You really are. You stroke her as to how marvelous and good that she is. And I read you something about one of my heroes. Jonathan Edwards, the greatest of all American theologians. A guy, actually he's a woman, named Dodds, that wrote a book about the marriage of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. He named it uh, Marriage to a Difficult Man, or she named it that. And then one chapter goes this about Sarah Edwards. I think they had 13 kids. Quietly carrying the drudgery that freed her husband to study, and that's what it can be sometimes. Boy, you slug it out rearing those kids. Incidentally, all careers get to be jobs. You know that, don't you? There's no innate glory to a career. 
I don't care what it is, it gets to be a drudgery. Quietly carrying a drudgery that freed her husband to study, Sarah Edwards also managed to train a brood of history, or, or children whose social contribution is a phenomena in American history. In 1900, A.E. Winship tracked down 1,400 of their descendants and published a study of the Edwards children. Quote, whatever the family has done, it has done ably and nobly, Winship contended, and he went on, much of the capacity and talent, intensity and character of the more than 1,400s of Edwards family, because they lived in the 1740s and 50s, is due to Mrs. Sarah Edwards. By 1900, A.E. Winship made his study, and this single marriage by 1900 had produced 13 college presidents, 65 professors, 100 lawyers and the dean of an outstanding law school, 30 judges, 66 physicians and the dean of a medical school, 80 holders of public office, three United States senators, mayors of three large cities, a vice president of the United States, a controller of the United States Treasury. Although the men had college degrees and many completed graduate work, the women were repeatedly described as great readers, highly intelligent, although girls at that time were not sent to college. Members of the family wrote 135 books, ranging from five years in an English university, I could have written that, so, or 10 years in English university, to a tome on butterflies of North America. They edited 18 journals and periodicals. They entered the ministry in platoons and sent 100 missionaries overseas. Sarah Edwards, 100 missionaries. As Winship put it, many large banks, banking houses, insurance companies have been directed by them. They have been owners or superintendents of large coal mines, iron plants, oil interest, and silver mines. There is scarcely any great American industry that has not had one of this family as its chief promoters. The family has cost the country nothing in Poverty, crime, hospital, or asylum service, on the contrary, it represents the highest usefulness. The line still continues to be vigorous, intelligent, enlivening to society, yet all this achievement came out of a family with no large inherited income. As a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards got fired at his church in Connecticut because he asked for a raise because he had kid number 13. Smart church. All the children's accomplishments were the result of their personal initiative. Quote, has any other mother contributed more vitality to the leadership of a nation? It's really not an amazing statement, though, because the proverb saith, the descendants of the righteous shall be mighty in the earth. And they were the way this woman taught them. Dr. Peter Marshall, who was one of the great Presbyterian ministers, New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., he began a message on one occasion, the most famous message he ever preached. And he said, once upon a time, there was a town that lived by a spring. And he was giving it in this beautiful Scottish brogue of his. But he said, there was a town that lived by a spring, and the spring was the tourist spot of the area. And people came to drink of its beautiful waters and to look at it roll down the mountainside and he went on about the glories of this spring and this little town that grew up around it. And there was one man that had a job that had a monthly stipend there in the town and he was called the keeper of the spring. And his job was to make sure that the mouth of that spring that fed that town that the town grew up around, that the mouth of that spring always stayed free of algae and fungus and, and filth and bacteria, that it was always pure to drink and to, beautiful to look at. And as people began to come in, there began to be some more building in the town, and the church fathers wanted to expand. They needed to cut costs in different places to expand over here, and so they looked at the money they paid to this elderly gentleman that was the keeper of the spring. They figured they could make money by firing him, so they cut him loose. And shortly thereafter, people began to get sick, and the water began to take on a brackish brown, and it began to have a scum, and it began to stink. Pretty soon, people began to move out, and the town began to die. And they found out that that little man who had that seemingly small talent and small seeming job to take care of the, the fountain of their spring was the only thing that separated their town from being a beauty and their town being an eyesore. 
And that was a illustration Peter Marshall gave in beginning a sermon on Mother's Day in Washington. And he said, in our society today, we have one that is called the keeper of the spring. And she is a mother. And she manages the fountain of our world and of our nation. She builds the children by her very body. The child breathes through her very life. The child looks at her with his first eyes. And everything that child thinks about the universe is first impressed by the job of that mother. And we have today, he said in the 1940s, lowered her to a low and a beggarly position. And he said, my friends, when this woman ceases to be excellent as the keeper of our nation, our nation shall no longer be the nation that it is. It shall be an eyesore and an embarrassment. And Peter Marshall's words were prophetic. Ladies, you are the keeper of the spring. If God calls you to be a mother, then you do not stoop to be a king. God save the queen. Motherhood. If you are single, flourish where God has you. If he keeps you single and you choose to be single and you serve God as a single, bloom where you are planted. But should that day come that a man comes to your life, then ladies, you seize the day that God has given you. And do not think that in any way being a mother or having a child separates you from the glory of life. Because those people that tell you otherwise, I do not respect who they are, I do not respect where they came from, I do not respect their ideology and the basis of their knowledge, and I for dang sure do not appreciate the society that such rancidness has produced. God save the queen. You be a mother, and you grasp it with all of the energy and all of the passion that you have, and you shape eternity. It comes from your very life. Well, let's pray, and we'll let Michael dismiss us here when I finish, and we'll be off. Our Father and our God, there are a great, great many of these right here who owe their lives to someone that only they and God know. And that is the one that created, that was the instrument of their creation, that gave on loan to them their bodies. We bless you for those mothers. I thank you for the mother that loved me from my first breath for the mother that spanked me and taught me purity and right from wrong. Thank you for the mother that had the courage to call me to the standard of God, the mother that was not afraid to back off on the, the standards that she knew were true and that would stand defiant against the evil of my day. And no matter where I come and no matter what I do, I will never ever excel any higher than the standard that my mother set for me. And I thank you for these many that were touched. And I pray, God, for your mercies and for your adverse education of many of these that were touched by bad mothers. I pray, Father, that you would teach us not to be otherwise. And I pray that out of this room, that there would be in that time when that time shall come in your good pleasure, I pray that these ladies would seize the day and that our nation might be a great and a glorious nation because of the faith, love, purity, and sobriety taught by glorious mothers. And I pray for these men not to be so foolish, not to be so foolhardy as to ever let their eyes roam from that despot of their home, that manager of their house, that educator of their children. I pray that these men would exalt and glory and bless the wives and the mothers that these women shall become. We bless you and we thank you in the precious and saving name of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.